A parable of Jesus is told in Luke 16. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Nathan. I'm on staff here at the church. And uh, that story that you just heard is one of those Jesus stories. In fact, maybe the most of the Jesus stories that leaves you scratching your head. It leaves you going, what was the point of that? It's a dishonest manager. And at the end of it, Jesus commends him as the hero of the story. What's the deal with that? Is Jesus saying that if I was just a little more dishonest at my job, like if I could find a way to cheat my boss, had a little bit of money, as long as it works out for me, then everything's fine? Some of you are really hoping I'm going to say, yes, that's what he's saying, but no, no, I think you can tell. In fact, Jesus makes pretty clear what he's saying, but somehow we read these things and, and they leave us scratching our head. It's not much different than when you've ever watched like a movie with someone and they, they fully misplaced who the hero in the story was. Like, I remember when I was in middle or high school, I watched that movie Fight Club with some friends of mine and they were like, you know, the point of that movie is like men had gotten too soft. Like men need to kind of get back to their warrior roots and they need to, you know, we need to be kind of be tougher and more masculine. And they forget the fact that the guy who came up with the fight club in the movie was a terrorist who had a split personality disorder. He was not the hero of the movie. You're not supposed to go, that guy had a good point. It's like when people watch Breaking Bad, the TV show, and they go, the point of this story is desperate times call for desperate measures. And they forget the fact that Walter White became a drug kingpin who murdered people, including a child, and died in his pool of his own blood. Not a good story. You're not supposed to watch it and go, man, if I was in his spot, I'd probably do the same thing. Well, you just miss it. We miss the point. But Jesus makes clear his point to the disciples uh, in this. But in case you didn't catch the details of the story, I'm going to quickly fill you in. Jesus says there's a rich man. And because he's so wealthy and he has so much stuff, he's got a money manager, someone who's taking care of his stuff. And this money manager has been accused of wasting his possessions. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to just fill you in on where we've been in this whole series. You and I are money managers. You and I are managing God's stuff. God has an abundance of stuff. He has given it to us. We are to be the managers of that, just like the man in this story. And so what happens is the rich man the owner of the stuff, comes to this wasteful money manager and he tells him, you got to settle up your accounts, you got to clean out your desk by the end of the week, you're gone. You've messed this whole thing up, I'm not trusting you with anything anymore. So this wasteful manager is in crisis. He thinks, 
I'm losing my job for gross negligence. I'm not going to get another one like it. I'm not strong enough for manual labor. And he says, I'm too proud to beg. So I don't know what I'm going to do. So he says, I do know what I'll do. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, then people will welcome me into their houses. Now, most of us don't get this because if you had a bank manager and he lost his job and he says, can I come live with you? You're going, not so much. But in this culture, this is a hospitality culture where turning in favors, doing a favor for someone else, right? It is as good as currency because if I've done you a favor, you owe me a favor in return. And I don't mean this as a joke. The closest thing you could think of to it is the movie The Godfather, right? I'll do a favor for you, and then one day I'm going to call upon you, and I expect a favor in return. It's the way their culture worked. So he thinks, I've got a way to kind of make this thing work out. And so somehow, we don't know how, because it's not really the point of the story, but he goes behind the boss's back, and he helps his clients out by cutting their bills by these kind of pretty large percentages like you saw. Some scholars think that what he did was he just decreased the price of the items, which would actually cut into his boss's margin, right? He just said, no, that doesn't cost as much as it did before. Other scholars think that what he actually did was just cut out his commission on the sale. He just said, I won't take my commission on the sale. So he loses a little bit of money, but he gains a favor in the process, right? We don't really know. Jesus doesn't make it clear because it's not really the point of the story. But Jesus says at the end of this, the owner commends the dishonest manager for doing this. And in case you missed the point, Jesus makes it clear. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, on the first week of this series, uh, really kind of the setup for the whole thing was we talked about this word, mammon, that in uh, Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount is what gets translated as wealth and possessions. I said part of the reason it was hard for scholars to know really why Jesus chose this word is because he's the only person to use the Aramaic word mammon to mean possessions, and he only does it two times. He does it in the Sermon on the Mount, and he does it in this story. This is the other place that we have it. And when Jesus says worldly wealth, he's actually saying mammon. And maybe your translation of the Bible says unrighteous mammon. Use your unrighteous mammon to gain friends. And if you remember from week one, this term mammon, it really could be Jesus referring to the idolatry of money because there are some scholars who think there was this ancient Assyrian god that had a name that was very similar to mammon. And so Jesus might be doing like a pun. If you like puns, that works for you. He might be doing a little bit of a pun on the word mammon to say, hey, you're trusting in this God of wealth instead of the God of Israel. Or it could just be that this Aramaic word, uh, mammon, which actually means trustworthy, what Jesus is trying to say is you are trusting in a power other than God when you are trusting in your unrighteous Mammon, he's trying to talk about our relationship with money. How you begin to trust that if you have enough money, you've got a bigger safety net. You've got a security blanket that money is the way that you'll get a good and pleasing life for yourself. And in this way, money takes the place of God in our lives. We have more faith in our money, in our mammon, than we have trust in God. And when that happens... We said this about the spiritual reality of money. We no longer possess our possessions. We become possessed by them. They have a spiritual hold on our lives. And we end up trusting in them more than being filled with the Spirit of God. So Jesus says in this story, you should use your worldly wealth or your unrighteous mammon while you have it. Because, and you and I both know this, you don't have it forever. And I'm even talking about the end of your life. Even the money, it's not as trustworthy. Some of us have been in, in that place before where you had some money and you thought, man, that thing is secure, and then suddenly it was gone. And you realize this thing isn't as trustworthy as I thought it was. But certainly you know 
you have a limited amount of time on this planet. And when you stop breathing on this planet, you don't get to take your mammon with you. It stays behind. So don't buy into the myth that, hey, wealth is a trustworthy thing. Right? You can trust in this. This source, it'll take care of you. You should use the money, the unrighteous mammon, not to trust in it, but to prove yourself trustworthy. You should use this money as a way to prove I am someone who can be trusted. Because Jesus says, whoever can be trusted, and this is an explanation of the past verse. It's not just a random thing Jesus said. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. Whoever is dishonest with very little is also going to be dishonest with much. Jesus is saying this unrighteous mammon, which can corrupt you and can take control of your life, do not trust in it. Because it's actually a test to see how trustworthy you are. It is actually a test to see, can God trust you? And he says, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, this unrighteous mammon, who's going to trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who's going to give you property of your own? Right? This brings us back to that first week. I cannot get confused about it. This wealth, though I am the one who has it in my possession, though I am the one who holds it, it does not belong to me. It is someone else's property. And one day the owner of the property is going to check in to see, have you used it in the way I intended you to use my property? wealth. He's watching to see how you handle it. And if you prove yourself to be trustworthy rather than trusting in the unrighteous man, then he will trust you with true riches of your own when you arrive in eternal dwellings. Now, you're like me, you want to know what them true riches. I mean, what's the return on investment here? I want to know, you know, I mean, how much do I got to give to get the next level? I want to get to that gold level sponsorship, right? I want to get up to the next level. What is that? If I use wealth the way God asked me to, what am I getting out of it? Does he have a prospectus I can look over on this thing? But Jesus doesn't seem interested in explaining any of that. And maybe that's because he knows this is an issue of trust. And if I trust my master, then I trust whatever he is going to give me is going to be for my good. It's going to be good. He doesn't have to tell me ahead of time what it's going to be. I just have to trust him. It'll be worth it. Jesus simply says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve both God and mammon. And then if you were reading this book of Luke, where this story comes out of in one sitting, if you were sitting with your physical Bible open, what you'd notice is this is all part of even a bigger story that's been going on the whole time, where Jesus is at a well-known Pharisee's house, and he's already told a bunch of different stories in Luke 14, where he tells about this banquet. We talked about that a few months ago, right? And then he tells the, maybe the most, three most famous parables he tells about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then eventually a lost or prodigal, which prodigal means wasteful, son. There's a wasteful son, and then the next story is a wasteful manager. And he tells these stories to these people at this party, and most of them are Pharisees. And then we're told in the next verse, the Pharisees who loved money, they heard all this and they were sneering at Jesus. It's as if they despised him. He said to them, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Now this is where, if you're paying attention, Jesus' story and teachings on money actually get pretty harsh. Not only is the issue that you're trusting in the wrong things, but you have learned to value what is actually detestable in God's sight. I think the brother of Jesus, uh, James is his name, picks up on some of this language when he writes a letter to an early church and he says this, Now listen, you rich people, 
which if you've been here, you know, that just the fact that you were born in this country, no matter how well you're doing in comparison to other people in this country, you're a rich person. He's talking to you. Now, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Now, this language, so you know, is apocalyptic language. What I mean is it is this big, pronounced kind of language. He is trying to draw their minds to really uh, the end times. He is trying to draw their eyes to there is coming a day when the master is going to return, when Jesus will return. And though you have it really good right now, you should start weeping and wailing for the misery that's going to come on you. And he says this, in those days, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver, these trustworthy things, are corroded, and their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire, for you have hoarded wealth in the last days. So in modern language, all our storage units, all our garages that are stuffed full of junk, all our estates and inheritances that we leave behind, the food we toss out, the piles of obsolete devices that junk up our homes that we don't use anymore, they will be the evidence in the last days that we had more than enough money to do our master's will. They're simply proof we valued the wrong things. That's what Jesus is accusing these religious leaders of. You may do all the right things. You may know all the right things. You may believe all the right things but you love all the wrong things. And he illustrates that with another story. Jesus says to those listening, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. This is a pretty common setup for Jesus' parables. Two people in vastly different positions. There's the rich man, who is a highly valued member of society. He's dressed in expensive clothing. The mention of fine linen is probably a reference to expensive undergarments. So Jesus is saying, even this dude's underwear is luxurious. Everything about this man's life was admirable. He's the person being envied by others in the culture. And then there's Lazarus, a poor beggar, who longs to just eat the trash this guy throws out. Lazarus was detestable to society. He's so low that only dogs pay attention to him. As they lick his sores, he's not just ignored, he's despised. But Jesus has just said, what people value highly is detestable in God's sight, so we shouldn't be shocked by what comes next. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. This is the great reversal that's common in Jesus' teachings, the first becoming last. What is highly valued in this life is detestable in the next. The rich man who trusted in his unrighteous mammon had not been carried to eternal dwellings. But Lazarus, who had no wealth, not even enough money for food, he is with Abraham, one of the greatest heroes of the Jewish faith, and this torments the rich man. And so he comes up with a plan, Father Abraham, Have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. Now what's interesting is that the rich man knows Lazarus' name. It wasn't that in the rich man's life that he didn't see Lazarus or know of his needs. He knew his name. He just couldn't be bothered to help. Maybe he even found Lazarus detestable. He had no use for him. Lazarus was just a drain on society, but now he needs Lazarus' help which brings to mind Jesus' teaching from the previous story. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Maybe if this rich man had used his worldly wealth to gain Lazarus as a friend, he would be in a different situation. But still, he doesn't see Lazarus as a friend. He thinks that even in heaven, Lazarus must be a servant who Abraham can order to bring the rich man water. But Abraham says, son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. You trusted in your wealth, but Lazarus proved himself to be trustworthy, even when all he received was difficulty in life. And now Lazarus has true riches, and you have agony. This is a heavy story, 
it feels harsh. Now, not if you're poor in this life, you are looking forward to a great reversal of things. But for those of us who live in one of the richest nations in the world, where if you earn over 60,000 per year, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. These words about wealth and treasure are difficult to wrestle with, especially because we don't feel very rich. We still feel like we're making it paycheck to paycheck, and we'd rather just ignore this story. But as followers of Jesus, we don't get that right. We must take seriously Jesus' call to not live for unrighteous wealth, but the true riches of heaven, which leads us to another teaching of Jesus on money. He says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart also will be. These are the true riches of heaven. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And that's the issue. What does your heart want? Jesus knew the heart of the Pharisees. They loved money. But Jesus wants our hearts to value what God values. For us not to try and serve two masters. To love one and despise the other. To love God and despise what God finds detestable. To not trust in wealth that will rot. To not let our clothes that moss have destroyed be the evidence of our unfaithfulness. To be trustworthy with untrustworthy riches to sell our possessions and give to the poor, that we will have treasures in heaven. Then we will treasure what God treasures. We will treasure who God treasures. One thing I found interesting when I was studying on this is that uh, Lazarus is the only person in any parable that's given a name. Now, all the other ones have titles, Good Samaritan, Persistent Widow, those kind of things. Some scholars think the reason why is maybe this is actually a true story. Maybe Jesus is talking about someone he knew in this situation. I love, though, the fact that Jesus gives him the name Lazarus because Lazarus is one of Jesus' best friends. He's the one that Jesus went and raised from the dead. If you cannot tell from this story what Jesus treasures, then you're not paying attention. Jesus cares deeply about the poor and the vulnerable, those in need. He even tells a story towards the end of his life where he tells his disciples that whenever you clothe the naked, whenever you feed the hungry, whenever you visit those who are sick or in prison, he actually doesn't just say, you did a good thing in my name. He says, you did this to me. He's identifying himself. He's so treasures those who have been ignored and despised and stepped on in this world that he identifies them, identifies himself with them. He says, whatever you do to them, you're doing to me. And so if you want to love me, you love them. If you want to serve me, serve them. If you want to meet my needs, I didn't know God had needs. If you want to meet my needs, meet their needs. Love me by loving them. If you treasure me, you will treasure them. And that community Christian, we are people who are learning to love like Jesus, to treasure who he treasures. We are people who do not want to be possessed by the spirit of mammon that convinces us over and over again, though we have more than 99% of the world, I need a little bit more. I need just a little bit more. More treasures on earth more fun and exciting experiences, more zeros in the bank account, more junk that I'm going to stuff in storage one day. We want to be filled not with stuff in storage units. We want to be filled with to overflowing with the Spirit of God. We want our hearts and our lives and our wallets to be formed and shaped in the image of Jesus. We want to treasure who He treasures. I mean, the point of these teachings of Jesus, just so you don't get confused on it. It is not somehow that if you give enough money, you're going to get bigger and better things in the world to come. Nor is it if you don't give enough money, God's going to somehow come and get you. That's not the point of this. This is about what does your heart want? And see, the great lie that we believe is my heart can want something my body won't do. The Apostle John says at one point, if you love God, and you see a brother or sister in need, and you do not reach out to help them, how can the love of God be in that person? You can say what your heart wants, 
your body and your wallet and your time and your words, they will prove what your heart really wants. And the more wealth you hold on to, it isn't about how much money you make. It's about how much I'm holding on to. The easier it is for mammon to find its way into your heart. But if we can learn, as Ed taught us last week, there is a way to live wisely within what God has given us. There is a way to live wisely where I am saving some for the future, not hoarding up, but I'm saving wisely for the future. There is a way to make sure that I have enough set aside so that when there is a need, I can do something. Then I can be cheerful when I give. If we learn to treat the money that we possess as it does not belong to me and I'm just managing it, then we will actually start to pay attention. What does the owner actually want? Forget what my heart wants. What does his heart want? Because it's his stuff. And God certainly gives us stuff to bless us for our own enjoyment. But as we said on week one, the point was to grow my enjoyment to the point that I actually believed what Jesus said was true, that it is more blessed It is happier for me to give than it is to receive. My greatest enjoyment in this life is not what I can hold on to, but how much I can get away. And so today begins our favorite season as a church, and we call it do something around here. Do something is the short phrase that we use to remind ourselves of this call that Jesus has placed on us to not only receive his blessing, but to become a blessing, to be a blessing to others. It's not our job to fix everything and the problems in this world, but we can all do something with the blessings that God has given to us. This is not a time of guilty obligation for us, that somehow I have more than other people have, and so I should feel bad and I should do something about that. It's also not some kind of health and wealth prosperity thing that if I just give enough away, God's going to get me even more coming my way. This is a time when we actually find the teachings of Jesus to be true, that when we treasure what he treasures, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he gives us what we truly want, which is the ability to be a blessing like he is a blessing. We can become a cheerful giver, but not only does God love a cheerful giver, what we find to be true is we are more cheerful when we give. I somehow enjoy what I have left over as I give some away. Because our hearts are being joined to the heart of Jesus. We are learning to treasure what and who he treasures. It is a gift to us. So next Sunday, we'll have the names of children in our county for our annual Christmas in Coweta project where we take the wish list of children here in our community who need a great Christmas and we go and purchase those gifts and we give them to the parents so that the parents can give them out on Christmas morning and it is one of our favorite things but that is next Sunday today is the day that for I don't know maybe a decade or more Ed has been up here asking everyone to give $29.95 that's right some of you already know to these end of year projects we give in our community and around the world for those in need and now That torch has passed to me, but I'm not ready yet to ask you for $29.95. What I want to do is I want to tell you what we're actually giving to this year. And here's the truth. I am very excited about these particular projects because these are not one-off things we're doing just so we have some projects at the end of the year. These are the overflow of the way God has been shaping our hearts as a community for people all around our community and around our world. So the first thing that you'll uh, be giving to today is our counseling center. If you've been around our church for the last year or so, you know that Jason, uh, who's been doing our hosting this morning, as a pastor on our staff, he's gone back to school to get his uh, master's degree in counseling. He's working to be fully licensed for the sake of us being able to provide affordable counseling for those in our church, but also in our community. I don't think I have to tell you of the rising need of both anything to be affordable these days, but also the rising need uh, for true mental health care in our community. And I don't have to tell you because many of you have experienced this personally. Many of us have experienced it. Many of us have people in our lives who have experienced this deeply. 
And we know that God cares deeply for those who suffer from anxiety or depression or suicidal thoughts, all these kind of issues. And we want to be people who meet people in the needs that they have. And in order for us to keep the rates affordable for people who are in need, we want to build up a scholarship fund to be able to offer help to people whatever needs they have regardless of their level of income then no one should be denied help just because of the level of income they have. If we can help, we should help. And so that's what part of the money you'll be giving to goes to, is to build up this scholarship fund. But it's also going to go to the efforts uh, that we have been working in the last year and a half or so with building up a partnership with Welch Elementary. We want to help children in need in this local school. Uh, Ed was up here uh, about a year ago when we were talking about this, and Welch is the largest elementary school in our county and also has the largest amount of need in our county. And earlier this year, we introduced to you uh, Linda Bennett, who is from Elevate Coweta, and we were able to uh, provide her a salary and a place there at Welch Elementary through a partnership that we've done with Southcrest Church here. So it's not only a win for us in that we get to partner uh, with this, this school, but we get to partner with another church to do what Jesus said and be united as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so this is a huge win for us that we've been able to be a part of this. Linda not only coordinates our team of mentors, and I know many of you in this room have been mentoring children. I have a child that I mentor every single week, and uh, it's a chance for us to build relationships with children in our community who mostly just need an adult who would come and sit with them. Every week I ask my young boy, I say, hey, so what made you happy this week? And he says, it's the same thing every time. It's you. You came to see me. You came to see me. And just the fact that there are people that would say, hey, we want to be there. We want to be in lot, involved in the lives of these children, even just for 30 minutes a week who will listen to them and care about what's going on in their lives. It is life-changing. But she not only coordinates that, she also works with at-risk families in this school to help them get other needs met that they may have. And so part of the money we'll give today, it's going to go to support Linda and the needs of Elevate at Welch Elementary so that we can be a part of taking care of children in need in our county. But that's not all. There's more. Uh, We got one other thing that we are given to. We have a partnership with a community in Guatemala, La Nueva Independencia, which I said like a gringo, but I'm sure there are other ways to say that. This summer, we sent a team uh, to live and work in that community for a week, and we as a church have been sponsoring the children in that community. And we're learning, hey, what if we cared for children hundreds of miles away as if they were our own? What if we treasured someone else's children as Jesus treasures them? So we have been a part of uh, working with this community and their leaders have come to us and told us of two really big needs that they think that we could help them with. Uh, It's two programs that we're going to fund. First is a Foundations of Farming program that's going to help the farmers in that area uh, learn how to use more modern techniques to kind of reap more from the land that they have so that they can sell more and get more uh, income coming into the community. But we're also going to have a program uh, that is a business startup training program uh, that is open to anyone, men or women, but it is primarily focused on the women in that community. And I love the way they said it. It is to help moms and grandmothers provide sources of income for their families as well. We want to bless this community in this way, to not only give to a need, but to help provide dignity for them to say, hey, we are a part of what God is doing in this as well. And so now is the time I'm going to ask you for $29.95 to give towards these programs. And this is the way we always say it's $29.95 per person in your family. But I, I want to be clear before I even get fully into how to do that. These are not just projects that we're doing because some of us feel guilty about the amount of money or I was really emotional in this and you feel the need to somehow do something about this now. This is about us learning how to use our worldly wealth 
our unrighteous mammon, that all of us suddenly begin to trust over God so that we can love our God over the money He gives us and treasure who He treasures. So here's how you can give. Uh, on screen right now, there's a QR code. So I'm going to ask everyone to get out your phone right now. Even if you're not going to do it, just pretend with the rest of us. Get out your phone, scan this QR code right here. It'll take you to a page where you can see some more information about the projects that we're giving to. But there's also right at the top a place where you can click a link. It'll take you to a secure link where you can give and make sure you have uh, the do something fun selected. It should be auto selected, but in case it's not, uh, go ahead and make sure it's selected because all the money that's given to the do something fun, none of it comes to us. It goes straight to this project. Or if you're not going to use your phone, that's okay. On your chair right now, there's an offering envelope that we've already put a sticker on it that says do something. My kids were doing that this week, and they said, I hope someone uses these envelopes. I said, I don't know. I don't, not many people carry cash, but we'll see. If you've got cash, you can put it there. Or if you're old enough to have watched the Dick Van Dyke show and you still use checks, you can fill out a check and make sure you get the memo line written down. Do something on that, and you can give $29.95 per person in your family. So just to make it clear, if you're a family of four, $29.95 roughly comes out to $120. If you're like me and you've got four kids, you're a family of six, you got to have less kids. That's the deal. Stop having so many kids, all right? But still, you can give. Now, here's the truth. If you're at a place today where you don't think you can give $29.95 per person, that's okay. Give what you can give. Because this is the point that we always make every year is, this is not about the amount of money we receive. We're going to help people in need as a church. That's who we are. This is about all of us getting to participate. This is about all of us getting to share in the joy of giving. And if you can't give a full $29.95 per person, that's okay because there are other people in this church who could give more than $29.95 per person. This is about us becoming people whose hearts are tor turned towards God and turned towards the people He cares most about. And so here's what I'll also say about the 100% participation. We have teenagers in the room right now. And I used to do this all the time when I uh, was the student minister. But for some reason, um, and maybe it's because I now have kids in student ministry, I'm not cool enough to come around. But I have a microphone today. And so I'm going to tell you this. This is what we always say. Some of you have jobs. You already have income. So it should be easy for you to give $29.95 to this. Some of you, you don't have income. So this is what I always say for parents in the room. It's the same thing. Go ahead, and this is the only time I'll say this, you can act like the prodigal son in this case. Go ahead and go to your parents and say, I'd like a little of my Christmas money early. I'd like a little bit of my Christmas money early. Give me a little bit of what you were going to give me at Christmas so I can give to this. And I'll say this for the parents who are in the room. You have to actually honor that. You can't do the thing that every parent wants to do. If that's the sweetest thing, I'm going to give you even more at Christmas. No, this is about them actually having a chance to do what Jesus has called them to do and to understand it's okay for me to have a little less this Christmas because I'm blessing somebody else. And so this is about participation. This is about us as a church, from the youngest to the oldest, becoming a group of people who truly love and trust in Jesus more than anything else. Now, I've been talking long enough, and I don't want you to feel like this is more of a sales pitch than it may already feel. I want this to be a joyful opportunity for you to experience the joy of God's heart, which is to be generous to us. So I'm going to give a few moments of quiet for you to decide what it is you can give. If you're new here and you don't feel comfortable, that's what I say all the time, don't feel obligated to participate. This really is a family thing. This is, a, this is about who we want to become. But you are welcome to join in. We would love to have you be a part of this. Then after a few moments of silence, our band's going to come and lead us in singing about our desire to be people who love like Jesus. So let's take a moment, and then we'll sing together.
Thanks for stopping by to check out this message. If you've been feeling the call to take your next step in following Jesus, we're here to support you every step of the way. Feel free to reach out to us at community-christian.net or connect with us on any of our social media platforms. And hey, I'm super excited to share that we've got two amazing podcasts you might really enjoy. First up, there's Three Peas in a Pod, where three of our speakers dive deep into questions about the Bible and life. Then there's Not Great Parents, which is just perfect for us parents navigating the ups and downs of parenthood. Both of these podcasts release fresh episodes every week, so make sure to tune in and give them a listen.